Gracious Lord, it seems the first autumn leaves camp when there are no pastors. And maybe, Lord, there's a lesson for us lay people that, Lord, our confidence ought not to be in names and talent and popularity, but, Lord, our confidence ought to be in you. Our eyes ought to be focused on you. And so, Lord, I pray you know my weakness, my feebleness, my defectiveness, Lord. And I pray that uh, we may all be persuaded, no matter what we see outwardly, that there is nothing good in man. And all our goodness, Lord, comes from you. And so, Lord, there is nothing that anyone possesses that is to be admired, but we are to look to you, Lord, and to covet spiritual gifts because you will bestow abundantly as you have shown in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I got a little poem to open up off with. Uh, it's not going. Okay. I'll, I'll get my little poem. It's called Calf Trails. So if, I hope the camera wasn't needing me to be at the front. Our, our technology is, is not going. All right. So please, uh, you're going to have to use your imagination, what people used to use before for technology. All right. One day through the primeval wood, a calf walked home as good calves should, but made a trail all bent askew. A crooked trail as all calves do. The trail was taken up the next day by a lone dog that passed that way. And then a wise bellwether sheep pursued the trail over vale and steep. And drew the flock behind him too, as good bellwethers always do. And from that day over hill and glade, through those old woods a path was made. And many men wound in and out, and dodged and turned and bent about, and uttered words of righteous wrath, because twas such a crooked path. But still they followed, do not laugh, the first migrations of that calf. And through this winding woodway stalked, because he wobbled when he walked. This forest path became a lane that bent and turned and turned again. This crooked lane became a road where many a poor horse with his load toiled on beneath the burning sun and traveled some three miles in one. And thus a century and a half they trod the footsteps of that calf. Each day a hundred thousand stout followed the zigzag calf about, and over his crooked journey went the traffic of a continent. A hundred thousand men were led by one calf near three centuries dead. They followed still his crooked way and lost one hundred years a day. For thus such reverence is lent to well-established precedent. You know, enlightened though we be, we like to follow the beaten path. You know, no one likes to be on their own. We all like to follow the well-traveled road with the crowd. You know, the power of habit and example is so strong that most of us find ourselves following grandma, granddad, great-grandma for centuries on. Habit carries on. Especially in these days with our heroes and famous people, we are most prone to follow trends. We do as others do. Custom influences a good many of our actions. 
Now, this part would have been really good to have some slides because you would have seen the pictures that I had. If the world is wearing pointed shoes, I had really good photos from the 1500s of pointed shoes. <laughs> then we're inclined to do the same. It's not like we come up with some new idea of fashion and think, you know, I wonder if I could wear this. No, we see and we do. That's right. You know, if some silly slang expression is going around, we're most likely going to catch it and start saying it too. The, the phrase, it's popular with texting, but OMG, it just swept the rounds and everybody says OMG now. How it caught on, you wonder. And then uh, Steve Irwin had crikey, and then people start saying it. It just catches for some reason. Especially if someone famous says it first, then everybody's going to be doing it. Now, we follow calf trails in our dress, our eating, our conversation, our recreation, and even in our worship. We do not like to be different. Most of us would rather be shot than laughed at. You know, uh, back in the day, where, I'm, where I come from at least, when your jeans were torn, they needed a... A patch but these days <laughs> they can be this ripped and it's now fashion how did that happen I don't know then there's now skinny ankle jeans that come up to here now if I wore those back in the day that say I borrowed my little brother's pants <laughs> but now it's fashion Bikinis, speedos, tights were once considered undergarments, underwear, but now it's fashion. Smoking, it used to be only what they do to meat and fish, but now it's fashion. Then we have social media. When I first came, I didn't have internet in Zimbabwe. So I came and then they say, hey, are you on Bebo? Now, some of you might not know what Bebo is, but it goes back to when I first came. And you say, oh, I'm not. What's that? And instantly, you're on it too. And then they had high five. And then Facebook came and it took the world. And then even Facebook is becoming old. Now they have Twitter. And now the latest thing is TikTok. Now, it happens just like that. Someone says, are you on, what's that? And then before you know it, it's spread. With the younger ones, you have Lego, unicorns, slime. I don't know if any of you have seen the slime craze. And they come and go, these fashion trends. They pass away because they are not there for function but for fashion. When it's there for function, it endures the test of time. But when it's there for fashion, before long, it's gone. And we wait for the next one. Now, the Bible is filled with accounts of God's people becoming infiltrated by the ways of the heathen around them. Now, you're going to have to use your Bibles for this part. If you want to turn to Psalm 106, now this is the record of all of Scripture, the conflict of the two kingdoms, Psalms 106, and I'm going to read from verse 19 to verse 22. It says this, they made a calf in Horeb and worshipped the molten image. Thus they changed their glory into the similitude of an ox that eats grass. It says, verse 21, they forgot God, their Savior, which had done great things in Egypt, wondrous works in the land of Ham, and terrible things by the Red Sea. They forgot God. Now, it goes on. In that same passage, if you go up to verse um, 35, 
It says, but they were mingled among the heathen and learned their works. And they served their idols, which were a snare unto them. Yea, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters unto devils and shed innocent blood, even the blood of their sons and their daughters, whom they sacrificed unto the idols of Canaan. And the land was polluted with blood. They learned the ways of the heathen, heathen and it influenced them so much that they got to the point of sacrificing their own children because it was custom. Hard to imagine, really, but it happened. The Bible tells us so. Lot in Sodom, if you read in 2 Peter chapter 2, it tells us that that righteous man, in seeing and in hearing their unrighteous deeds from day to day, vexed his righteous soul. And what happened to Lot's family and his daughters? They were so corrupted by the ways of the people around them. That's just what happened. And so I, I, thought, I thought, oh, we of little faith, we of little faith allow our view of the world, our standard of righteousness to be shaped by what we see more than what we believe. You know, we measure ourselves by those around us and righteousness is what society approves and sin is what society condemns. That's how it is these days. Now, I so wish I had this uh, slide. Sorry, Mr. Cameraman. But I'll read you this slide from the computer. Now, you guys might know this because you probably read the article. U.S. House of Representatives and their new code of ethics. As part of the 17th Congress now in progress, the House passed a new code of conduct that includes what House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's office calls sweeping ethical reforms, some of which are designed to promote diversity and inclusion. Under the changes, words like father, mother, son, daughter, brother, and sister will be replaced in official documents by the gender-neutral terms parent, child, or sibling, respectively. You probably read that in the Herald last week. So following this, then the pastor, his name is... I've got him there. Pastor Emmanuel Cleaver, he's a Democrat representative. He was saying a prayer. And this is the last words of his prayer. We ask it in the name of the monotheistic God Brahma and God known by many names, by many different faiths. Amen and a woman. You can take this, the, the, that, and the slide is on there. It's on there. Now, a pastor said that prayer, if you can believe that. The world changes, and the influence rubs on the church, and the danger is that now the pastors begin to shape the religion of the people. Because they're famous, they're big names, and so people take them as the standard of righteousness. And that's just what we do. We go by what we see more than what we believe. Jesus said, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax, shall wax cold. So that's saying that we would become so influenced by the world around us, right, that we would lose our love for God and his law. That's the words of Jesus. Pastors become the interpreters of the law of God for the majority of churchgoers. And when the blind lead the blind, they both fall into a ditch. That's what happens. If the pastor says nothing about it, then it can't be bad. And if the pastor condemns it, then it must be bad. So you end up with Pharisees and Sadducees, liberals and Conservatives, why? Because who's m making the standards? The pastors are shaping the standards. 
So conservatives believe that liberals are the reason the church is a mess. They're lowering the standards, right? And liberals believe conservatives are the reason the church is a mess. They're too legalistic, they're old-fashioned, unadaptable, and they're making the standards too extreme. Religion is shaped by the religious men of the day, and repentance is measured by their conduct. So if I asked you for some big, big names in the Christian world that people quote, you would probably know familiar names like Joel Osteen, Rick Warren, C.S. Lewis, huh? Big name. It's almost quoted as an authority. They'll say, C.S. Lewis once said, as though it means anything. It doesn't mean anything. He's just as good as Doug or Brent or anyone else. Ravi Zacharias, Billy Graham, Spurgeon, Piper. People quote their sayings as doctrine. How about in our church? Do we have big names? Tell me a, a big name. Doug Batchelor, yeah. We've got Mark Finley. We've got Walter Vyth. These are big names. And praise God for their ministries. The danger is that our way of affiliation is if he's a conservative, then everything he says must be right. If he's a liberal and I'm a liberal, then everything he says must be right and I must support him. Now, here's what happened with Desmond Ford. So I perceive he was a conservative of some sort. And he then went and he drew many because he's either in the name of conservative or in the name of liberal, whichever group camp he was in. And along with a lot of good is a lot of, a lot of junk. But because people are following the person, it entirely took the church uh, unprepared. And people found themselves miles away from the standard, which is Jesus Christ. Unaware unaware. Now this is only so that we can realize that the biggest names, no matter how powerful their ministries, do not shape our faith. They do not shape our faith because we begin to divide each other based on, oh, I don't like Steve Bohr. I don't like Doug Batchelor. I've heard this. I don't like so-and-so. And so the church begins to be shaped and divided according to names. I am of Paul. I am of Apollos. Now, I'm getting somewhere with this. Okay, this is in light of the subject evangelism. Now, turn with me to Matthew chapter 15. I'm painting a picture of where we are going to begin. In Matthew chapter 15, Jesus is addressing this issue, right? Then came to Jesus the scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said to them, verse 3, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor your father and your mother, and he that curses father or mother, let him die the death. But you say, so whose word? Their word versus God's word. You say, whoever shall say to his father or his mother, it is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. You hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, this people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. All right. Now, you had the religious leaders of the day shaping the faith and practices of the people. And they were doing as the people said. And they were making people break the law of God in order to hold to the tradition. And isn't it clear from the passage that the people were doing so? They were following along with what they were saying. That's just what happens. And you have Matthew chapter 6, 
where Jesus says, when you do your charitable deeds, don't sound the trumpet as the hypocrites do where? In the church. When you fast, don't disfigure your faces as the hypocrites do. Now, who are the hypocrites? The religious leaders who are shaping the practices of the people of God. When you pray, don't do like them. Now, we are prone to following what we see rather than what we believe. And Jesus was saying, don't do like them. Don't do like them. So here you have a little bit of a contest today. And I'm saying this because we have a mission. And the mission is hindered by things that I really believe are not the standard. So when I first came into the church, I used to sit through three-hour debates of the nature of Christ. A, a big email I just read recently uh, about if you use or, or sell any other version of the Bible but King James. Now, I'm a King James person, but it is not a sin, let's be clear. It's not a sin if you're trying to clarify because you just can't get the English. It's not a sin. It's a man-made standard to call that a sin. It's not a sin. Um, we have some that will condemn people that will sing his eyes on the sparrow because it's not in the hymnal. <laughs> or we have a big movement of date setters. I, I don't know if you guys have heard them. I've had many over the last while coming and telling me, and if I'm not agreeing with their date setting, I'm lukewarm. I'm lukewarm if I don't believe it's going to be in five years or in seven years or according to the calculation. And when it fails each time, there's no humility to say, I'm sorry, I was a false prophet. They just carry on to the next date. And then on the other side, this is on the conservative. On the other side, you have just be yourself. I wouldn't become a Christian if I wanted to just be myself. I don't want to be myself. I want to be a new creation. Be true to yourself, they say. And then there's this popular saying, Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship. It sounds nice, but it's a covering to say, I don't want to be told about laws. I just want to do what I want to do. It's about a relationship, they say. Or trust your gut. <laughs> Follow your heart. Okay. I think you get the picture. That we have a church divided, not because of the Bible. That's what I'm getting at because of people. Matthew 23, a big chapter on what the Pharisees were saying and doing versus what God taught. So I just want to read a few. I've got nine slides here expounding on what I'm saying. And it says, the teachers of Israel were not sowing the seed of the word of God. Christ's work as a teacher of truth was in marked contrast to the rabbis of his time. They dwelt upon traditions, upon human theories and speculations, often that which man had taught and written about the word, they put in place of the word itself. Their teaching had no power to quicken the soul. The subject of Christ's teaching and preaching was the word of God. He met questioners with a plain, it is written, what saith the scriptures? How readest thou? There's our point of unity. Next one. Christ's servants are to do the same work. In our day, as of old, the vital truths of God's word are set aside for human theories and speculations. Many professed ministers of the gospel do not accept the whole Bible as the inspired word. One wise man rejects one portion, another questions another part. They set up their judgment as superior to the word. And the scripture which they do teach rests upon their own authority. Its divine authenticity is destroyed, thus the seeds of infidelity are sown broadcast, for the people become confused and know not what to believe. Another one. In the days of Christ, the rabbis put a forced mystical construction upon many portions of Scripture, because the plain teaching of God's Word condemned their practices. They tried to destroy its force. And you know, it normally happens like this. The sermon is marching forward, and he reads the text, and then he says, in other words... And you don't catch that he just said in other words and gave you a whole different interpretation of what the text is simply saying.
The same thing is done today. The word of God is made to appear mysterious and obscure in order to excuse transgression of his law. Christ rebuked these practices in his day. He taught that the word of God was to be understood by all. He pointed to the scriptures as of unquestionable authority. I don't speak Greek or Hebrew, and I'll tell you what, it, that's okay. You don't have to understand the deeper Greek and the Hebrew in order to read what the Bible says and understand it. You don't need a, a Strong's to get into the original. It doesn't help you obey at all, does it? All it does is it makes the common person think, oh, I'm just not smart enough to understand the scripture. I need to leave those who understand it in the original language to interpret it for me. And there's an undoing of what the reformers have done. Why did they translate it to English? Can someone who has great insight tell me why they translated it to English? So we can understand it. So why are we untranslating it back to Hebrew if all those years and bloodshed was so that we could understand it in English? Does that make any sense? Do I have any authority to say, you know, the translators made a mistake here. It should have been. Do I have any authority to do that? Do you hear this often? One man can say, you know, they didn't quite translate it there. It should have been. By whose authority? It took many people to come up with every word you have in our King James Bible. And don't think you have the authority to say, well, I say. It goes on there and it says the Bible is to be presented as the word of the infinite God, as the end of all controversy. Because when people start to deconstruct it, it loses its, its power in the minds of people. People have no longer deep reverence for the scripture because actually, oh, it was written by men. You need to read it in its original. Don't you hear that often now? Because it's constantly being untranslated by people. And so people can... Just hold it and think they can interpret whatever portion they want to suit what they like. Now, the point of this is that when it comes to the work of mission, the church is so divided. And, you know, there's a man called John Wesley and George Whitfield. Now, they had very strong views and opposing views. One was believed in predestination. The other believed in free will. And the difference was so strong, it says in Great Controversy, chapter 14, that they were going to split because their views were so strong about those particular subjects. But then it says, but they realized that the call of the gospel, the mission was much stronger, and they put aside their personal differences, and the work marched on. Now, are there nuances that we differ in? Yeah, of course. But is there a work that can unite us as a body? And when we do that, we find we grow closer and closer to Christ and to each other. Whenever we stop doing that, we start looking at each other and them and those and these, and no one is doing any work at all. I've never had at the door anyone who asks me about the Greek, the Hebrew, or any of the complex theology which we're constantly fighting over. Never. Nine years of door knocking, never once. That's how relevant it is. All right, here, let's make progress. Okay, Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. This is a very familiar passage. So this gives context to what's taking place when Jesus is now there in his day, and this is the, the situation, right? The church is so divided. Paul said that he belonged to the strictest sect of the Pharisees, which means they were groups and clusters of people within the church. They were sects of the Pharisees, sects of the Sadducees, and Paul was the strictest sect. So they were many, many, many groups within the church divided over opinion, the traditions of men. And this is what Jesus says, do not think I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I have not come to destroy, but to fulfill. I'm not going to preach against that group or that group. I'm going to preach the word of God. And you'll find that the word of God condemns all the groups 
because they see that they fall short of the glory of God. I have not come to lower the standard or to make it too difficult. I have come to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law until all be fulfilled. Whoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. If your righteousness only goes up to the standards of the pastors you look up to, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven, no matter how big their name is. So he says, now I want you to get this text and think about the context. I'm not twisting scripture. Verse 21, you have heard that it was said by them. Tell me, is Christ referring to God or Moses when he says you have heard that it was said by them? Do you think so? Is Christ trying to correct God or Moses here? What do you think? No. No. You have heard it was said. Who's saying? In Matthew 15, who's saying? In Matthew 23, who is saying? It's the Pharisees and the scribes. They take a clear text. Yes, God said, you shall not kill. But which standard do they leave that text? How do they interpret it? Up to the standard which they fulfill. But Christ says, but I say to you, that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause. This is not a new principle. The Old Testament said, you shall not bear a grudge against your brother in your heart. So Christ is just elevating the law to where it was already, where God intended it to be. There's no contradiction between the Father and the Son. And part of that is why people tend to look at the Father as, oh, he's a stern judge, but the Son is approachable because people interpret the Bible in that way. There is no there is consistency. I, it says there, angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Who shall ever shall say to his brother, Raka shall be in danger of the council. I was working alongside a pastor who thought swearing was okay. And he swore and ate bacon and he called himself a Seventh Day Adventist. I'm not joking. Not a pastor anymore, obviously. But this was what he was teaching his congregation. And Brother George and I obviously were banned from preaching there for obvious reasons. But the point is this. The point is this, that, you know, the standard cannot be a person. If you hear a pastor swearing, that doesn't make swearing okay now. If a pastor decides to eat bacon, does that mean it's okay? Of course not. Of course not. But does it not make people feel more comfortable in sin when the pastor is also? Absolutely. But you will both be lost. You won't be excused because of what the pastor is doing. All right. Let's carry on. I hope you can see that that's exactly what Christ is doing. He's undoing the entanglement. It says, you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you, Whoever looks at a woman to lust after her has already committed adultery in his heart. So that means that our, our social custom, when I was, people say terms like she's hot. It endorses a contradiction of Christ's words. Those terms are endorsing lust as socially acceptable. We don't say that. We don't do that. Because Christ said, that will send you to hell as much as committing adultery will. Pornography rampant because people aren't thinking that even looking with lust is a sin. They're thinking it's just the act because the standard is being set to match what the people are doing. I don't know if you know the statistics, but many of our pastors struggle with pornography. You know that. You probably do. Men are not the standard of righteousness. Now, another thing, the things that are sins in God's eyes these days are now called 
addictions. So therefore, it dampens the blow, and now what is a sin in God's eyes must be diagnosed by the doctor as a sickness or an addiction. Idolatry is a sin, and addiction is idolatry. That's what it is. I know, it sounds like, oh, that's socially unfriendly. Addiction is idolatry. Alcohol, cigarettes, marijuana, sex, TV, cell phone, social media. If you're addicted, you're guilty of idolatry and you need to repent. It's as simple as that. And you might need a lot of prayer and agonizing to break it, but it's sin and it's sin. You can get diagnosed all you want by the doctor, but no prescription will get you to heaven. Because addiction these days is being dampened and they label things with all sorts of new hospital names, but it's idolatry. And the wages of sin, even if it's social media, even if it's sports, even if it's food, if it's idolatry, it's sin and the wages is death. And Christ died to redeem idolaters and adulterers, and the rest of the list. Now, I want to read to you, because the, the title is New Covenant, so I want to read to you some terms of the New Covenant as Christ gave them. I want to read to you Luke chapter 6, and it's only a small portion. There's more, as you know, but I, I just want you to evaluate yourself based on God's standards. You know, the saying OMG is known as a saying, but it's a sin called blasphemy, taking God's name in vain. And it's popular because people don't see it as a sin. Luke chapter 6, verse 27, and I'm going to read all the way to verse 38. I want to lift up the divine standard to you in your hearing. It says, but I say to you which hear, those of you who are listening, love your enemies. Do good to them which hate you. Bless them that curse you. Pray for them which despitefully use you. And unto him that smites thee on one cheek, offer also the other. And him that takes away your cloak, forbid not to take thy coat also. Give to every man that asks of thee. And from him that would take away your goods, ask them not again. And as you would that men should do to you, do, you also, do ye also to them likewise." For if you love them which love you, what thank have ye? For sinners also love those who love them. And if you do good to those which do good to you, what thank have ye? For sinners also do the same. If you lend to those of whom you hope to receive, what thank have ye? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. But I say, love ye your enemies, do good, lend, hoping for nothing again, and your reward shall be great. And you shall be children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father in heaven is merciful. Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, you shall be forgiven. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give, give unto into your bosom. For with the same measure you meet, with all shall it be measured to you again. Now, i got a question. If that is the divine standard, only a snippet, I haven't read to you the entire, but if that's a divine standard, can I ask, how do you fare against the divine standard? How do you fare at loving your enemies, blessing those who curse you, doing good to those who despitefully use you, saying hello not only to your friends, but even to your enemies? to strangers, going out to do good to the world. If that is the divine standard in our homes, husband, wife, how do we fare at the divine standard? How do we fare? Because when Jesus finished giving the Sermon on the Mount, he said this, he that hears these words of mine and does them 
He'll be like a house built on the, on the rock. So when the mark of the beast comes, what is the pre- best preparation? To hear the words of Jesus and to, and to do them. Because the winds are going to blow, we heard. The winds are going to blow strongly. The floods are going to rise. And they're going to beat upon these houses of God. And are they going to stand, is the question. Are they going to stand? Are we living up to the divine standard? You know, there's a a man who was a carpenter. I was reading his book. His name is Paddock. That's his surname. And he was saying that he went along with his friend who's a builder, and he was told to cut this length of two by four, four by two, four by two, two by four, four by two. All right. (laughs) All right. So he was told, this is the template. Cut them this long. So, okay, he took this one, put it on the timber, and And then he put away the template, took the one he had cut, put it on, let's, puts away that one, cuts, takes the one he cut next, next one. Now, after he's cut about 30 pieces of timber for the outside of the house, they put them alongside each other. How even do you think they were when the blueprint was left 30 steps back? He was way off the mark because he left the standard. And he took a reflection of the pattern, and the next one took a reflection of that pattern, and the next one... Now, how far do you think you get from the pattern if everyone, from the pastor to the elder, to the elder to the this and that and that and that? You're so far from the standard, and you don't even realize it. You don't even realize it. Okay. Now, I, wanna, I want to give you a, a little bit of a testimony as we come to a close. When I first became an Adventist, the person who Bible studied with me, now, I was as worldly as worldly can be. Now, I'll, I'll give you a blueprint, huh? They were homeschooling, country living. I know nothing about any of this. Plant-based, you know, they, their kids did chores at home. They did Bible work, especially when I found out that they were living by faith. You got no income. What? You don't have a job? Now, to me, this was heavenly. It was entirely heavenly because I'd never seen it before. And how exalted and angelic it was. And praise God, till this day, I feel I owe them my life. I owe them my life. But what happened was... I never read the blueprint for homeschooling, blueprint for plant-based, blueprint for any of that. I just looked at them and I did. So I was going to work with a lunchbox with raw beetroot, asparagus, and and whatever I could put in there because I just want to copy them and I want to do it as best as I can. I don't know what the blueprint is, but I'm, I'm trying to do what they're doing. Eventually they moved. And so now... You're the Bible worker, Clayton. You're going to lead the church. Now, I haven't read the blueprint about all these other things. I've done the Bible studies. I'm going out door knocking. But the things that I'm carrying was being supported by the people I was following. Now they're gone. Now the weight of all these things is crushing me because life is getting difficult. Now, where do you turn to when you don't have the blueprint? Oh, can you come back? How do you do this again? They're gone. And you find you start to crumble under the weight of things that Christ should carry, but because you don't know the blueprint, you don't know the reference, and you begin to drift. Praise God, the blueprint is available, so you can go back and read it. You can go back and read it. Now, I want to close with this little portion of Scripture because it will give us a perspective on our outreach. And it's in Luke chapter 5. And it says that the Pharisees and the scribes saw Jesus eating and drinking, verse 30, Luke chapter 5, verse 30, eating and drinking with publicans and sinners. 
Now, this is not the way they were taught in their training for evangelism. They come past land and sea to make one convert, and that convert became twice a child of hell. But now they look at Jesus eating and drinking with publicans and sinners. Hey, we didn't learn this in our training. And Jesus said, they that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And they said to him, why do the disciples of John fast often and make prayers? And likewise, the disciples of the Pharisees, but thine eat and drink. And he said to them, can you make the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them. And then they shall fast in those days. And then he spoke a parable saying, no man puts a new piece, a piece of new garment upon an old. If otherwise, then both the new makes a rent and the piece which was taken out of the new agreeth not with the old. No man puts new wine in old bottles, else the new wine will burst the bottles and be spilt and the bottles will perish. But new wine must be put in new bottles and both are preserved. Now, I'll tell you something you already know. As a church, we carry the weight of failure when it comes to the gospel commission and the three angels message. Now, is this true or false? Don't we feel like we've failed? The work we should have been done, then we've failed. And here's what's happening. We're carrying the baggage and we're crumbling under that baggage. And God's saying, look, what you need to do is not carry the weight of your failure, but to put it down and start again and say, Lord, how do I start from scratch? Because the more I look, the more I see that more people aren't doing the work that should be done because it's too heavy. It's crushing them. And it's because they're trying to carry all their failures and trying to make up the debt that they owe God and work to pay it back. God is saying, as God's people, we have failed. But you see, our denomination arose out of failure and disappointment. And do you know how they started again? They put aside their failure, the ridicule, the mocking, and they began to study as though they wanted to be born again, to start afresh. And that's really what we need to do. We cannot fulfill what we have failed because we have so much neglected work, so much unfulfilled duty. Are you going to make it up? Are you going to work hard enough to make up for all that you haven't done? Can you carry the weight of all you have neglected to do? Any takers? It would crush you. It would crush you. We know how much we've neglected to do, how much opportunities God has brought and we haven't done them. And that guilt weighs on us and it makes us do nothing. <laughs> God is saying, put that aside now. Start afresh with Christ. Start afresh. Put away the guilt of unfulfilled duty. Start afresh and take the next person God brings your way as the first person of your new experience. Make a new covenant with God. Lord, I'm going to start today. I cannot pay the debt of my sins. I cannot. Christ can. Christ did. Confess it. Put it in the past. Start afresh. And God will do for you what he did when you first got converted. Because it was easy then, wasn't it? You just did it. You were filled with the Spirit, and you went out unhindered. But somehow you got weighed down with despondency and failure, and you couldn't get back up again. I've seen it. I've experienced it. So I'm saying to you, God wants to make a new covenant with you today to say, look, we're going to start a fresh relationship, a fresh agreement, and all you have failed, I will wipe away. It will not be remembered. I want to walk day one with you today, and I will write my law in your heart and in your mind. Otherwise, you will not finish the work. I guarantee you, you will not. So I want to pray with God's people that feel like they've failed, and they realize they can never make up for their failure. They're always not good enough, always drowning, trying to climb out. Put it away. Start again. God's not going to condemn you. He wants you to start as a little child 
and learn again from the Master. So let us pray and ask God to empower us to put away tradition, the expectations of man, the failures, the guilt. God wants to offload your burdens and allow you to be free to be a servant of Christ, to serve him with joy, not with guilt and fear. Father in heaven, Lord, there are people in here longing for a spiritual refreshing, for an outpouring of the Spirit, Lord. But we are so weighed down with guilt of failure, with despondency, Lord, and we struggle to get up. We struggle to live a life victorious. Lord, there is one where there should be a hundred missionaries in the field. And so, Father, I pray as a people, Lord, we have broken your covenant. We have not fulfilled our vows to you and our promises, Lord, and we cannot dig ourselves out. We cannot work ourselves to a right standing with you. And so we come, Lord, acknowledging our guilt, and we ask that you may forgive each one of us, Lord, for we have sinned. We have neglected to do that which you have commissioned us to do. We have been influenced by the customs of the world. We have allowed the thorns and weeds of the cares of this life to choke our experience. And Father, you want us to lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us. And Lord, to be born again. We might be Nicodemus's, Lord, but before you were just little children, and except we're born again, we will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So, Father, I, I pray, Lord, for the old and young in this room, those that are 40 years in the faith and those that have just come in. Lord, we're all alike before you this day, and we have all fallen short of your glory. And all of us need this day, Lord, a renewing of heart and mind. We need to be born again from heaven. We don't need training that is earth-born from some man's intellect and wisdom, Lord. We want to be taught from Christ alone. Give us your word, Lord, not the wisdom of men. Father, I pray, pour out your spirit upon your people who are longing for a refreshing. Renew us today, Lord. Let us begin a new walk with you. Cast off the shackles of sin that weigh us down and help us to begin this walk with you afresh. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thursday? Thursday? I don't know if it will be practical to go out in the afternoon because it's booked for a speaking slot. So the one that is certain, I thought, for those of you...